This native vegetation is the result of one of the oldest cycles in the world, the cycle of the soil providing nutrients for growth, the climate giving moisture and the sun's rays, and then the vegetation itself providing oxygen, shelter and structure to link it all together. That's great for the bush, but what about farms? Well, the difference is quite simple. The bush grows according to the interaction of numerous natural forces. But on farms, man has intervened and become the dominant force, attempting to bring these natural cycles under his control. In doing so, he's often eliminated the backbone of the natural cycle. In the farmland plan, the aim is to restore a balance which will protect the land and so its production. One of the most exciting and rewarding things about changing any farm is planning the native vegetation. The Potter plan aims to develop a natural support system by planting native trees and grasses in carefully selected parts of the place. And the key to that is fitting in with the farm production needs. Just consider the benefits to production of securing the topsoil, or at least reducing erosion. And the advantages of wildlife, which help control pests, like insects and mice. Trees around paddocks can block the winds, so protecting the growth of plants and lifting yields. In the same way, shelter belts can improve stock yields by protecting animals from extremes of weather, hot and cold. And vegetation can be a major force in the management and distribution of rainfall. It can slow down the movement of water across the land and make it more available to crops and pastures. Vegetation can halt and reverse the pattern of degradation, stopping gulling in damaged areas and saving further damage to top production land. And in saline areas, deep-rooted trees and grasses planted above the salty parts can reduce the amount of saline water in the soil by lowering the water table. A vegetation program aims to restore the health of the existing vegetation and to increase its diversity so as to enhance farm production. But a vegetation program isn't just about planting trees. If you've got any native trees or bush on the place, think about fencing the area off and allowing it to regenerate. It can play a key role in the natural cycle of your land. And as far as new plantings are concerned, there's a lot to consider, like where the trees are placed, the variety, the understory species of shrubs and grasses, the fence protection they're given, in short, a design that incorporates the new plantings into the whole farm's operation. In years gone by, people who were interested in planting trees generally put another fence beside an existing fence and put in a plantation. But what we're saying is that's not necessarily the right place for that plantation. Perhaps you should be waiting until that fence needs replacing or if you can afford it, shift it, um, because the fence can be shifted and reused, and put, put the plantation where it should be, or where you think it should be, according to your, your new farm plan, yeah. where it's going to be, do the most benefit, not only for the farm, but for the stock and all the other things that we've talked about. In selecting your species, the trees and smaller shrubs are more likely to prosper if the seed has been collected from plants native to your area. However, if the land has undergone major change, species might have to be brought in from other areas which match your conditions. For example, 
Flood irrigation farms might need trees from high rainfall areas. And heavily supered country may need trees from very fertile land. One of the best success stories with tree growing was Peter Waldron. After collecting local species, he perfected direct seeding. For the 12 months uh, of the year, I'm watching the trees, uh, watching when they flower. It gives me an idea of which ones are going to have plenty of seed on, on them. I watch them uh, then until the, the uh, pods are nice and ripe. It's critical that you get them just at the right time. If you leave it too late, the pods will have opened and the seed will have gone on the ground. So I've got to pounce on them just before uh, they let their seed go naturally. Uh, it will keep for uh, seven or eight years if uh, we can keep it uh, dry and airtight. And also we should put in uh, some mothballs or naphthalene flakes to kill any uh, little spiders or wolves that uh, might affect the viability of our seed. Generally we've used the indigenous species. We're going to encourage the ecological chain to uh, continue along. Largely the red gums, uh, the blackwood, black wattles and the she oaks. As well in the salted difficult areas well, we, we've used the uh, paper barks, uh, honey myrtles and the smaller shrubby atop that uh, handle the, the salty tough condition. Generally uh, I drive in, in the post to mark out the area of where I want to uh, plough. I prefer not to spray uh, with uh, a weed killer. I would rather eat the ground out bare, then mouldboard plough, and by mouldboarding, turns the soil right over, it leaves us with a, a sterile surface on top. The weed seed uh, bank is buried under three or four inches uh, of uh, soil, but the fertility is, is still there. And so it gives us a break on the grass for uh, one to two years before the grass uh, really comes back and competes with our young seedlings. But the fertility is still there and the tree roots quickly get down to there. And uh, I tend to think that that's better than the scalping method where we take the fertility away. And of course the most important part is to uh, adequately fence it. In uh, most of my uh, direct seeding areas, I've been working beside an established uh, adequate fence and I've used uh, three-wire electric uh, fencing on the inside. So I sp spaced the posts out, which I cut myself. I spaced the posts uh, 50 metres in some cases, 40 metres, 30 metres, wherever there's a bump in the ground. That all the posts are doing is just holding the wires off the ground. It's the wires that uh, uh, keep the stock out, and of course uh, they're carrying the electric current, and that's the thing that uh, is the major deterrent. We generally allow 1% to 2% of the seed to germinate and we know how many seeds there are in a kilo of seed and so if we work out uh, our quantities we might just need a few grams of, of each seed. Uh, it only adds up to perhaps a half a cup full for 100 metres of, of shelter belt. Seeing we're dealing with such small quantities, well, we, I mix it with uh, sawdust and then I just walk along and uh, sprinkle the uh, mixture out by hand, just let it uh, drift down on, on the breeze and, and find its own little niche. The mouldboard ploughing uh, provides uh, some nice little uh, ridges and valleys where the, the seed falls into and we generally find that the uh, gum species will be growing out of a, a nice damp little uh, valley in the ploughing, whereas the uh, she oaks might seem to prefer a drier spot and they'll be coming up, up on the uh, side of a, a clod or the, the furrow. And would you believe Peter Walden raised 10,000 trees in this salted gully? And it only took a day to mulboard the area and spread the seeds. Beside his time, the only cost was a little diesel. Generally speaking, his ploughing approach works best in heavier soils. But in sandy areas, scraping techniques might work better, particularly in Western Australia and southwestern New South Wales. The most important thing is to find people who've had success with direct seeding, preferably in your local area. People who understand tree species and establishment techniques. Other than cost, 
The main difference between direct seeding and tube stock establishment is that in direct seeding, the farmer has little control over how densely and quickly the trees establish themselves. In either case, you have to get the seed bed right. You have to control the weeds and you have to protect the young growth from browsing animals and pests. Where you plant trees is extremely important. There are a number of things to bear in mind, like the prevailing winds, fire risk, problem spots, water, hilltops and ridges. Logically, shelter should run across the path of threatening weather, paying heed to prevailing winds. In the long term, many farmers aim to plant out all the unit boundaries. Fire is an important factor in the arrangement of vegetation around the house and assets, and each property can benefit by fire breaks across the direction of hot prevailing winds. Vegetation resistant to fire and able to recover from it should always be considered. Horticultural crops around the house and the shed and the yards can offer good protection always. Problem spots on the farm might need special treatment. Hard to manage areas or those of low productivity could be used for agroforestry production or for shelter or simply to re-establish vegetation and improve the landscape. In combating dry land salinity, try and use every bit of rain where it falls by planting perennial pastures and trees to absorb the water and deepen the soil sponge. And trees are the most effective way to lower the water table. Well, this, this area would have been one of the worst salt affected areas in the district to the point of where most of the ground around here was uh, bare of any vegetation at all. Around the outside here, I've uh, mobile ploughed and direct seeded the trees onto it uh, three years ago. But in the, in the middle, just over here, I was more worried about uh, erosion there, so I didn't plough it. All I've done is ripped and, and planted the tube stock. And they're going quite well now, but further up in the gully, I've planted salt-tolerant, deep-rooted uh, pasture, and that's equal to any pasture on the, on the uh, property now, carrying really well. As we talked about in the previous program, special attention needs to be paid to tree planting around water storages. Trees can be planted sparingly along stream banks to shelter the water and to increase the stream stability. Where possible, dams should be fenced and they should be surrounded with deep grass cover and sparsely planted with trees and shrubs. Grass cover is the most effective means of filtering the runoff water flowing into the dam. Trees and shrubs reduce the wind speed and so reduce evaporation, and they also improve wildlife habitat. Keep trees well clear of the entrance to the dam as they crowd out the grass and can also transpire water from the dam. Trees should also be kept clear of the retaining wall or leakage might occur. Deep rooted vegetation below the dam can absorb much of the seepage and eliminate bogging and erosion problems. In hilly areas, it's common to find the hills washed bare and the best soil silted into the valley below. The Potter Plan aims to reverse this trend by planting the tops of the ridges. Vegetation on the ridges holds the water where it falls and so protects the soil. And there are more advantages in planting the ridges. Shelter, number one, and protection of your laneways, if you've got them. Also, trees on the ridges have a positive effect on frosting, as they generate warm air on the normally colder hills, which then moderates the temperature on the nearby slopes and flatlands. In planning a property, these principles are the backbone of decisions about how, when, where and why. Like all elements of the Potter Farmland Plan, they require careful consideration and research. 
But these things are for sure. There's no one correct vegetation program. And we need to apply the principles to each particular property. John Marriott played a major role in refining a planting system for tube stock and assisting the land care groups in the area with their tree establishment. From the work on the demonstration farms over three years, the following plantation establishment principles proved really successful. Here we have a community land care group who are planting on public land and they've taken the time to rip this site during the autumn. They've sprayed it during the spring with a residual and a knockdown herbicide. And now they are planting what conditions are just absolutely perfect for planting at this particular time of the year. In preparing for planting, in the autumn or the dry season, rip along the planting lines with a single time ripper and go as deep as possible, at least 400 millimetres, so as to ensure a good shattering of the subsoil, an easy root and water penetration. In late winter or just before planting, heavily graze the area or spray along the rip lines with a knockdown weedicide. In early spring, spray along the rip lines again. To decide the best planting times, consult some experienced locals. Often it'll be mid to late spring, or in other areas, autumn or early winter. Planting here has been carried out with the use of the Hamilton tree planter and a small wheelbarrow. Most of the demonstration farmers wouldn't have even considered planting trees without protecting them from pests. The most effective here were these plastic guards. They were reused three times. In designing your shelter belts, try to have a mix of tall timber as well as short trees and shrubs and grasses. This helps the plants to grow in a healthy state and provides a range of habitats for small and large birds and animals. In addition, this system provides effective shelter, preventing wind from funneling through beneath the larger trees. Generally, the shelter belts at the demonstration farms were 15 metres wide and divided into four rows, with two rows of indigenous species at four metre spacing. The third row could be eucalypts indigenous to the area and spaced about every six metres. The fourth row was tall growing eucalypts, with every second tree to be felled at 15 to 20 years for thinning, which can then be turned into fence posts, poles or firewood. This shelter belt will give good close shelter within five years. This belt should also incorporate bushier understory species and a mixture of deep rooted grasses. There's a three metre space between the outside row and the fence which acts as a deterrent to stock reaching over and straining your top wires. It also makes for better tree growth. These belts can also double as emergency shelter in extreme hazards. They're big enough to take large mobs, and it's all made easier with sections of fence which can be laid down. The farmers are also installing shelter inside the paddocks, designing the shapes to match the contours. Finally, another trend in tree planting is connecting your plantation with the native bush to attract the fauna. This trend is extending to major catchment groups who in some cases are connecting their native tree corridors across a series of farms until they reach the native bush. Whilst there's a lot of planting ideas to consider, don't forget it's a long-term process. The potter farmers are continually changing their plans or adding to them as they learn more about planting. Generally speaking, farmers work out their own priorities and stagger their plantings accordingly. Perhaps at first concentrating on the ridges and shelter from the threatening weather and then developing the vegetation from there. But at all times thinking carefully about where to plant so as to help the land 
and to improve their production. Work through your planting ideas and experiment with them on the plan. In the end, these plantings are a very rewarding part of the farm's management. We've been encouraged to plant local species so that the migratory birds, when they do arrive, that they've got the local trees and shrubs that are flowering when they expect to flower. So if you put in all these strange or, or other species from other areas without putting without paying any attention to your local ones, you create problems in the chain for the birds that are travelling through. I think it's pretty important to have that backbone of uh, native indigenous uh, species there that uh, supports the ecological chain. Uh, certainly then you can, uh, if you get that backbone in, then you can uh, pad it up with uh, introduced species or uh, a species of tree or shrub from some distance away that uh, may be valuable for, uh, for timber or for attracting birds or just simply for flowers to, that are nice to look at it or whatever. But I think you've got to have that background of indigenous species there. And our farm in particular, from the wildlife habitat point of view, was badly destroyed. We were left with about 50 live trees on our farm at the beginning of the 80s. And the effect of those wide and linked corridors across our farm has been just dramatic and it's attracted birds and insects right across the farm now in just uh, five short years. If you've got, if you've got a wide variety of, um, of species, like you say, if a disease comes in, it's only going to take maybe a few of those species, and you're going to wind up with a lot left. If you've got just a few few species, and the disease comes in, you can wind up the whole lot. You only put in uh, a seven metre plantation and protect two rows of trees, your fencing cost is the same and, and therefore double the cost per tree as if you put in a four row plantation and protect it with the same length of fence. I grew a lot of trees last year at about 5,000 and you know, propagate them from seed. Well, if they grow better in their own, in the soil from under, under the trees, well, you're, much, you're going to get a much better germination rate. It's just a thought. So it's going to have to try, <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you had the, the whole of Australia Revegetated. Well, you said to someone you could revegetate the whole of Australia's farming land in 20 years. Um, that would be something pretty amazing. It's well within the bounds of possibility. <laughs>